Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Justin. It's great to be with you guys. Uh, let's open up our Bibles to uh, Ruth chapter 3 this morning. Uh, Ruth chapter 3. And uh, before we get into it, I'm going to invite uh, my, my friend uh, Paul Benton up uh, to come and be with me here. Let's give it up for him. Um, like I said, not, not only do I c- consider this, this guy a friend, uh, but, but Paul comes to, to church here. This is his church home here at Calvary Nexus. He's part of our Nexus family. Um, he is also w- one of the uh, local missionaries that we support. Um, Paul is the leader of uh, InterVarsity and uh, ministering to different uh, college campuses uh, around Ventura County. He primarily is focusing on Cal State uh, Channel Islands, and God has used him and the ministry of InterVarsity to lead 23 students to the Lord this semester. Um, yeah. Praise Jesus. So, um, and, and so if he wasn't uh, already talented enough, he also uh, has a really cool gift of doing something called spoken word. And uh, if you don't know what spoken word is, I like to describe it as poetry on steroids. Um, so Paul has written a spoken word that he's going to present to us right now, specifically about Ruth chapter 3. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Paul now, and uh, let's, let's enjoy this together. You can close your eyes if it helps you uh, listen to what God might be saying. This is a story about redemption, and there are three characters. The first one is you and me, us. And the second is the world in which we reside. And the third is Jesus, who stands just for a moment off to the side. So imagine with me, an endless plain stretches out to infinity in every direction, and a mirror falls from the sky at the intersection of time and space, showing not just our reflection, but our election and the way forward. We put on our best clothes, make ourselves look presentable, cover up all our scars, wounds, zits, and rolls. Make up cover girl, cover up dear, because whatever is natural isn't good enough, we fear. And we step forward to stand before character number two. We approach the base of the world and look. More vulnerable than total nakedness could ever be, our lives, memories, hopes, and dreams spread wide like an open book. And we do the only thing that comes to mind, showing our divine fingerprint and craftsmanship, a response programmed for love, designed for hope, molded and shaped and formed for loving companionship. And so we spread out our hands. Take me. World, will you take me? Want me? Do you want me? Will you keep me? Will you have me? I need to be had. It's not good for me to be alone. Will you have me? To which the world, character number two, replies, I will have you. I will have all of you. You will be mine. Mine to use and abuse, trick and prick. My personal play toy to strip you bare. Shave your heart down until your strength is as strong as a toothpick. I will wed you to money, sex, and fame. Your life will be a video game where the console is your heart, and each controller are my puppet lines to lift my finger and make you strive, work down to the bone, repeat, and restart. You will be mine, and I will divvy up your heart to the highest bidder. I'll send 10% to depression, insecurity, greed, and comparison. 15% to chasing carrot sticks as I ride on your back while you work 50 hours a week without enjoying your toil, Netflix, or quick fix. 15% to the deception that a European vacation, an annual trip to Disneyland will satisfy your soul and fulfill your perception. 10% to eating all the food you can find and buy to fill the emptiness inside to make you forget about what happens after you die. And 20% to the mask I will place over your face until you think you're in control of the workplace and that this life is about you, your race, place, and space. And suddenly you think you're brave, but all of you is mine, and you play the game thinking you're the player when in fact you're the slave. I will have you. I will have all of you. You are mine. And now this isn't just an allegory. Predatory character number two has made his wager an accusatory offer, and we have taken the bait. But there's another character, there's another character in the territory of our story. You see, a slave can't just be free, a prostitute can't just be shown a new job and expected to change. A cheater isn't just welcomed back to the family photo slideshow. They have to unlearn everything that they know. They have to have their legs broken in combo so they physically can't run off and give away their body anymore. 
They need to have their legs broken and then with splints, guardrails, and gauze. They need their legs healed, facing all the withdrawals and shown how to walk in the lightness of holiness too, in the freedom of purity and the laughter of love, into the courage of joy in order to really be made new. Calvary Nexus. We want freedom, but we refuse to have our legs broken first. You want Jesus, but you want the world too, and in the end, you'll get neither. We want love, but we want the world to love us too. We want redemption, but we want the universe to bless us too. We want to be Christian, but we don't want to tell others about it. And so we bow down to the universe, worshiping the shrine of comfort and safety, because I'd ask my coworker about Jesus on a lunch break, but I don't think they're interested. I was going to go on a mission trip, but I don't think it's safe. I was going to give away my money to a missionary, but I don't know if I can trust them to not just buy a new car. I was going to share my faith, but it might be awkward, so never mind. We want freedom, but we refuse to have our legs broken first. We want Jesus, but we want the world too, and in the end, we'll get neither. You must choose. We must choose. And the problem is that we already did. The living God, the God of the universe, stood before us, the creator before the creation, and spread out his hands. Take me. Will you take me? Want me? Do you want me? Will you keep me? Will you have me? You need to be had. It's not good for you to be alone. Will you have me? And we said, no. With every fiber of human history, every ounce of humanity's ancestry, emphatically, we said, no. We chose, and we can't go back. But there's another character in the story who can go back for us, who can reverse history, choices, and curses, memory, light, evil, pain, and verses, turning back the spinning of the universes, and the great exchange of God for man takes the choice of no in all its deathly finality and reverses. This God, man, Jesus, suffered, died on a cross, sacrificing for every bit of our lives that we have been given away to become our loss. Every drop of his blood in his body that was pierced, flayed, whipped, and ripped apart, shed for you to redeem every percentage of your heart. You gave it away to the world in your sinning, 10% here, 20% there, but Jesus said it was stolen from you in the beginning. And even now, he is opening up your eyes so you can be free. Jesus is the only one who wants you for who you are, who you were created to be. He is Messiah, Lord, lover, friend, father, judge, risen from the grave after being hung on a tree kinsman redeemer who stands here now offering you redemption. We belong to the world and are enslaved by it. There is no exception. In bondage, we're captivated through deception, created for goodness and glory, but living the life of a shadow in perception, believing lies and satisfied with the fleeting pleasures of this world shrouded in all misconception. Your redeemer is here and his redemption is with him. He stands here now, the living God of the universe. Jesus stands before us, the creator before the creation, arms spread and palms out. Take me. Will you take me? Want me? Do you want me? Will you keep me? Will you have me? You need to be had. It's not good for you to be alone. The gift I give is wholeness, healing, reviving, refreshing, and revealing. And this gift is to let your legs be broken first. Let me teach you how to walk, not according to this world, but according to the gentle, joy-filled steps of my kingdom. Will you have him, Calvary Nexus? Your kinsman redeemer redeem you from this world, make you beautiful again, and satisfy you with eternal pleasures as you lay down at the feet, at his feet in the night, and the king of heaven spreads his garment over your soul. Thank you, Paul. What a, what a blessing. Amen. We are in uh, Ruth chapter 3 this morning uh, uh, once again. And uh, the subject of what we're going to be talking about this morning is Ruth's quest for redemption. Ruth's quest for redemption. And the object or our hope of what, what God wants to do in our hearts is that you and I would experience a relationship with our Redeemer, that we would experience a relationship with our Redeemer. So would you please stand with me as we read God's holy and inspired word together this morning. We're in Ruth chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 1. I'll read aloud and you can follow along silently. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women were with you, is he not our relative? 
In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Verse 4, then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in and cover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Let's pray. Um, God, we just thank you, Lord, that you desire to speak uh, to us this morning. Uh, Lord, we we thank you that as Paul shared, Lord, that you are our redeemer. And we want to come to you this morning, Lord, because uh, we need redemption. And uh, Father, we just just pray that, that you would help to teach us how we can just experience a vibrant relationship with you, Lord. For that is what our heart is, is crying out for. That's what we look for in the world, Lord, that we can only find in a relationship with you. So, Father, just come and speak to us by the power of your word. Um, Father, I ask for grace to preach your word faithfully. Um, Lord, just teach us now, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Ruth chapter 3, let me just kind of remind us a little bit of what we uh, have been going through. Uh, We've been in the book of Ruth for a number of weeks now. In Ruth chapter 1, we meet a couple of characters uh, named uh, Naomi and Elimelech. And uh, they have two sons named Malon and Kilion that kind of sound like Star Trek characters to me. And uh, they're living in a city called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And ironically, there is a famine in the house of bread. There's no bread in the house of bread. So they decide to to leave and to move out to a place called Moab, uh, which God calls his wash pot uh, in in the book of Psalms. And uh, they go out there to try to find work, to try to find uh, food. Their two sons, Malon and Kilion, take two wives, uh, Orpah and Ruth. And uh, after this 10 years there, uh, sadly, um, this man Elimelech and his two sons, Malon and Kilion, they pass away. And uh, Naomi decides that she's going to go back to Bethlehem. She's going to go back to the house of bread. She wants to be with God's people once again. Uh, Orpah decides that she's going to go back to Moab and uh, maybe try to find a a new husband in Moab. But Ruth, uh, the Moabite, says... To Naomi, uh, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She says that she wants to to go uh, with Naomi into Bethlehem, into the house of bread. And as they show up uh, back into Bethlehem, Naomi sees uh, uh, some of her friends and they, they say, hey, Naomi. And her, her name, Naomi, means sweet or sweetheart or sweetie pie. And she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. And it says there, because she felt that God had dealt bitterly with her. And, and, and maybe that's your, your story. Maybe you feel like even this morning that you're living in Ruth chapter 1, that, that, that you feel that maybe God has dealt bitterly with you. And as the story continues to unfold, um, we see that God is not done, that her story was not complete, and that God, in fact, actually had a beautiful plan for her life, and not only for Naomi's life, but for Ruth's life. And we're told there in verse 1 that there is a certain relative named Boaz. And this word relative in the Hebrew is a word called goel, which means kinsman redeemer. Um, this was something that was allowed in, in, in the Mosaic law, that, that if, if a, a woman was a a widow, somebody could redeem her, marry her, purchase any land that may have belonged to her family, and take care of her. And we're told in verse 3 that it just so happens that she, she goes and she ends up in the field of Boaz. It's a sense of irony. It doesn't just so happen. Uh, it is God's providence that brings her into that field because God is moving and God has a plan. So we have a, a widow uh, that, that all of a sudden she meets this man, and it just so happens that he's a goel, uh, that he's a redeemer. It just so happens that he's rich. It just so happens that he's single, and it just so happens that he's godly, right? right? They, and and, and so, so Ruth here is, is like, okay, what's going on here? So they meet, and uh, Boaz sees her, and he says, who is that lady, right? Who, who is this, this young lady that, that I see working in my field? 
He goes and he asks her. They have their first date together. Uh, they sit down. They're, they're eating a meal together. It's not just any meal, but it's a nice meal. He brings her the roasted grain. Uh, this is not Taco Bell. There's no sporks involved. He has a shirt with buttons on it, right? This is a nice date. He's taking her out on this nice date. He, he's, he's not going Dutch. He's paying for the meal because that's what Jesus would do, men. And uh, he, t- he has her on this nice date, okay? So... After they experience this, um, we're told that she actually has leftover food. And guess who gets that leftover food? Her mother-in-law. Here's a free tip for you single men here in the room. When you take your girl out on a date, you're out at the Cheesecake Factory, and at the end you say, Waiter, hold on a second. What's your mom's favorite cheesecake? And then you order that cheesecake and you send it home to mom. So that's what Boaz does with Ruth. And she goes, in whose field were you gleaning today? (laughs) Who is this man? It's Boaz. He's rich, he's single, and he's godly. Oh, baby, oh, baby, right? (laughs) So um, we are are picking ourselves up here in the story in Ruth chapter 3, and we're going to see what God is doing to write their love story. The first thing that we're going to consider together is that Ruth prepares to meet Boaz. Ruth prepares to meet Boaz. Let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. Then Naomi said, or then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you are with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Okay, so here's, here's what's going on. Um, after this day, Ruth has been continuing to go to Boaz's field every single day, and there's nothing in the scriptures that would lead us to believe that there is any other conversation or point of contact, right? In other words, they have their first date, there's no text, there's no Facebook message, she doesn't know what's going on, is there going to be a second date, and, and Naomi says, okay, sweetheart, this has been long enough You're going to go and you're going to get your man today, Boaz, who is rich, single, and loves Jesus, okay? We're going to do something about this. So the first thing that she tells her to do is that she would wash herself. Let's read verse 3. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself and put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. I I have to say uh, about this text that the commentators kind of don't know what to do with this text. Um, Naomi kind of gives some advice that some people think is totally fine. Some people think it's very risque. Um, I'll let you be the the judge of that, but God works in his sovereignty out a beautiful story regardless of this advice that she's giving to her. The first thing that she says to her is that she would wash herself, okay? That she would wash herself. And we got to understand that this culture was very different than ours. Even here in California, as we're experiencing a drought, most of us will will take a bath or a shower daily or maybe every other day, or if you're having one of those weeks, maybe it's three or four days, right? But but we we bathe on a pretty regular basis in our culture. It was not so in in this culture. Um, You would only bathe if if it was a very special event or if you were going to be getting hitched. So Naomi here is saying, girl... We are going to get him to put a ring on it because he likes it, right? So, so you're going to take a shower. So she, so she tells her, you, you're going you're gonna to wash yourself. Um, in this same way, we're told in, in, in 1 John uh, chapter 1 at verse 9 that if we confess our sins to God, that he is faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us of all unrighteousness, that we experience a cleansing from Jesus because of what he has done for us on the cross. In addition to this, we're, we're told as, as Christians to seek to, to, to live a life of holiness that is honoring to God. Uh, we don't do this so that we would earn God's love for us because positionally we are forgiven through what Jesus has done for us, but we will experience the most vibrant relationship with Jesus as we seek by the grace of God to walk in holiness. This is why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
that we will enjoy a vibrant relationship with Jesus as we seek to walk in holiness by his grace. The second thing that she says to her is that she would anoint herself. She says, anoint yourself, right? This is a, a, a biblical way of saying, girl, you put on your perfume, right? So she takes out her Moabite madness, midnight in Moab. She's spraying this th- stuff all over her so that she, can, that she could smell uh, uh, really good. Uh, and, and we also see uh, in the scriptures that, that oil, that anointing, is a picture of the Holy Spirit, A.W. Tozer says something that that really convicts me. He says, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what the church is doing would go right on, and nobody would know the difference. And I pray that that would never be true here at Calvary Nexus. One of the things that I often pray for our church is that God would move in such a way that we wouldn't be able to explain it. That we wouldn't be able to trace it back, well, yeah, that person's really innovative, or they have really great leadership skills, so that's why uh, this is happening. But but we would kind of scratch our head and be like, I don't don't know how that person did that, right? That that we would be like, it's got to be the Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't be able to explain what is going on. So, so how do we experience the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Now, the scriptures teach us that when you become a Christian, that you receive the Holy Spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. But in addition to that, there's a very uh, interesting Greek um, uh, preposition that speaks of the Holy Spirit not only being in us, but upon us. That there is an experience in the Christian life where the Holy Spirit isn't only working in us, but the Holy Spirit is working through us. That it's this picture of the Holy Spirit pouring out of us so that we are affecting the people around us. So how can we experience this anointing of the Holy Spirit? Number one, we need to ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13. that, That we come to God and we ask him that he would pour out his Holy Spirit. Um, This is also what they do in the beginning of the book of Acts. They ask God to pour out his Holy Spirit. The second thing that we need to do is to repent of anything that may grieve the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He also gives this picture in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that our our body is like a temple or a house of the Holy Spirit. And and that when when we let the messes of sin live in our life, then the Holy Spirit has to go and be in, in, in some corner. So it's not a question of how much of the Holy Spirit do you have, but the question is how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? And, and we seek by God's grace to repent of the things that would grieve the Holy Spirit so that we could experience his power overflowing in our lives. What are some of the things that the scriptures say can, can grieve the Holy Spirit? Paul says in Ephesians 4, 25 through 32, lying, ungodly anger, stealing, corrupt speech, bitterness, wrath. These, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the things that can quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. So may we seek to repent of these things by the grace of God so we can experience the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Ruth was told to anoint herself uh, before entering the presence of Boaz. The third thing that she tells her is that she would clothe herself, that she would put on her, her best clothing or her best garment. Okay, this is what's going on here. You see, most commentators believe that at this point, Ruth had been walking around in mourning clothes, okay? Th- that's not the clothes you wear in the morning, but it's the clothes that you wear when you are mourning, right? That she has been mourning uh, the, the death of her husband. So perhaps she was walking around in, in black clothes so that everybody would know uh, that she was mourning. And uh, Naomi looks at her and says, okay, sweetheart, it's time to change out of those clothes and it's time to put on your best garment, right? And it wasn't like it was in our culture where you have a walk-in closet and 100 pairs of shoes and all these dresses, right? She would have one article of clothing that she would put on for a nice occasion or a wedding. So she says, take off your morning clothes and put on your wedding dress, girl. You're getting hitched, right? That's what, that's what Naomi is, is, is saying to Ruth. And in the same way, the scriptures say that that you and I, that we need to take off our grave clothes and we need to put on our grace clothes that we receive from God. Let me tell you, let me explain what I mean by this. In Isaiah chapter 64 at verse 6, God says that all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags, that, that the best 
effort that we can bring forth to be obedient, to, to try to please God, it's like wearing filthy rags. Be, because our righteousness is not enough to earn favor with God, but God goes on in the New Testament to reveal to us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So God takes our filthy rags of our greatest efforts to impress God, and he clothes us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And now we can stand before God, forgiven, justified by faith because of what Jesus has done for us. Additionally, Ruth learns how to present herself, verse 4. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. Um, this is a very uh, I- interesting verse here. So she says, okay, sweetheart, you're going you're gonna to take a shower. You're going to put on your Moabite madness. You're going to put on your best dress. You're going to go in, wait till he's, he's, he's finished working, he's eaten, he, he's, he's, he's had a couple drinks, and he's passed out, and then go in and uncover his feet and lay there. I, I got to say, there's some texts in the scriptures that are descriptive but not necessarily prescriptive. This is not uh, advice for dating teens that are in here today. This is not a, a, a good idea, right? Okay, this is just, this is what Naomi's saying. God's gonna work through it uh, by, his, by his grace, but it's not necessarily the, the best situation. So she's to go in and she's to uncover his feet and she's to, she's to wait there. It reminds me of a couple stories that we read about Jesus in the New Testament. One of them is in Luke chapter 10 at verse 39. We're told that Jesus goes into a house of a couple of sisters, uh, Mary and Martha. And Martha is very busy um, getting everything ready. She's cooking a meal, so to speak. And Mary is just sitting there at the feet of Jesus. And we're told there that, that Martha uh, gets a little bit unhappy in this situation. She's like, you're not going to come help me carve the turkey, right? you, you got to get in here, peel some potatoes, get to work, woman. You're just sitting there at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says to, to Martha that, that, that Mary had chosen the better place, being at his feet. We, we read another account in Luke chapter 7 at verse 38. Jesus goes over to the, the house of some religious leaders, some Pharisees, and, and they're sitting down for a meal. And in comes a woman who's described as a woman of sin. And she comes in, and she gets at the feet of Jesus, and she has an alabaster flask. This was probably her dowry, uh, very expensive. And she breaks it, and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with, with this perfume, with her hair, and with her tears. And the Pharisees, as they watch this, they say, If this guy was really a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman this was. And Jesus looks at these religious leaders and he says to them, imagine that there's one person that had a debt of 50 denarius and then they were forgiven of that. Now imagine someone who had a debt of 500 denarii and then they were forgiven of that. Which is more grateful? And they rightly say the person who is forgiven more And Jesus says, in the same way, this woman is experiencing my forgiveness. She didn't come um, in in her religion and in her pride and in her accomplishment like the Pharisees, but she came and said, I'm broken, I'm I'm pathetic, I have nothing. Will you save me? Will you forgive me? And that's how you and I are to come to God. We don't come with our righteous act and, and our accomplishments, but we come as beggars saying, would you have grace upon me? How do you come to Jesus? Do you come to Jesus boasting of your accomplishments? Do you come to, to, to Jesus bragging about your righteousness? Or do you come like that woman crying at his feet, saying, have mercy on me? And this is how Ruth was to go into Boaz. Fifthly, she promises to obey. Verse five, let's read. And she said to her, all that you say to do, all you say to me, I will do. 
So the Christian is to seek to obey God, although we may fail at times. The next idea that we're going to consider together this morning is that Ruth submits to Boaz. Ruth submits to Boaz. Let's read verses 6 through 9. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all uh, that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? She took, so she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Okay, so, um, so she, she goes in, and, and Boaz has finished a long day of work. It's a harvest. It's a good time. He had a, he had a big meal. It's, it said he's had uh, a couple of beverages, and he's very cheerful, and, uh, and, and he, 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 takes, he falls asleep at night. She goes in, and she uncovers his feet, and she's just kind of waiting there. Right? And it says at midnight, he wakes up, and he's kind of shocked, like, who are you, and what are you doing here, right? It's, it's like he's, he doesn't have any nightlight here, right? It's dark. He just sees this, this woman at the, the feet of his bed. He, who are you? And she says, I'm Ruth, your maidservant, and would you take me under your wing, uh, which is the Bible's way of saying, I propose that you propose, buddy, Right, okay? And ladies, there ain't nothing wrong with this. There ain't nothing wrong with this at all. Proposing that he would propose. Okay, that was a very nice date. I like the buttons on your shirt, but now it is time, buddy, for you to put, to put a ring on it. Right? It's, it's, it's time for us to get married. I propose that you propose. And this interesting language is given here of, of that, that he uh, would take her under his wing, the, another time that we see this in, in Scripture in the same context, this Hebrew word for taking a, under the wing is in Ezekiel chapter 16 at verse 8. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel. He says, When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. This is the speech of covenant. And just like God had covenanted with the nation of Israel, Ruth is saying, would you take me under your wing? Interestingly, in Ruth chapter two at verse 12, Boaz makes this observation of Ruth, that even though she was a Moabite, she was a Gentile uh, in a culture that didn't worship God or know God, that she had come and that she had made God her God, that she had come under the wing of God. And Ruth's saying, You've noticed that I've come under the wing of God. Now I'm ready to come under your wings. She's, I propose that you propose. And we do this same thing with Jesus. We come to him and we ask that he would take us under his wing. Have you done that? Thirdly, Ruth listens to Boaz. Let's read verse 10 together. Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. So we see here that that her redeemer accepts her, just like our redeemer accepts us. This was kind of a a, a risque thing that that Ruth had done. She didn't know, is is he going to to yell at me and be angry at me for, for being here? Is he going to accept my offer? Is he an ungodly man that will, that will do something sinful to me? And he accepts her. And he said, oh, blessed are you, daughter. And, and notice he, he makes this comment here that she had not gone out with the other young men, which tells us, and the fact that he would call her daughter, that he had some years on her. He was a little bit older, right? And, and so he was, he was thinking perhaps maybe the reason that there was no follow-up is he was thinking that maybe he was too old for her. He was not a spring chicken anymore. He didn't have a six-pack. He, he had a cooler, right? And he's thinking, like, I, I don't know if she's going to be into me anymore. But she's shown up, and she says, I, wa- I want to marry you, right? Which I, I want to speak to the, to the singles in, in the room, and I want you to notice that... It, it, you know, it's important that you be in a relationship with someone that you're attracted to. Yes, that's a part of marriage. It's a part of a relationship. But more than anything, you want to marry someone who loves God, who has character. 
And that's what Ruth had looked for in Boaz. And, and, and Boaz accepts her. He, he, he accepts her proposal that he proposed. And the next thing that we see is that our Redeemer assures us, verses 11 through 13, and now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Dun, dun, dun. Verse 13. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that he will perform the duty of a close relative for you. Good. Let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. So he assures her. He says, he says I am going to do everything I can to, to marry you, right? I'm, I'm going out today. I'm going to get size for my tuxedo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find uh, your, your, your ring, right? He's, he, don't, don't worry, sweetie. I am, I'm going to figure this out. And he also says here that there is a nearer relative than him. There's another guy. And he says, I'm going to take care of this other guy. We're going to have a very nice conversation together, and we're going to figure things out, right, uh, so, so to speak, because there is a nearer relative than, there, than, than Boaz, and he assures her that he's going to take care of it. In the same way, Jesus assures us. Um, during uh, the, the, around 1900, there, there was the Boxer Rebellion in, in China where many Christians were getting killed, and there was a missionary there named James Hudson Taylor, and he said this during that experience. He said, I cannot read, I cannot think, I cannot even pray, but I can trust. He was so devastated on what was going on around him. He couldn't read, he couldn't pray, he couldn't even think, but he could trust that God was doing something. And, and, and in this same way, Boaz is, is assuring Ruth that she can trust him, that he is, is looking out for her. And I want us to note a couple other things about this reality. Number one, I want us to, to, to notice the character of Boaz in this situation. It's, it's late, nobody's there, there's a beautiful woman sitting at his feet, and he makes the decision to do the righteous thing. He says that he's going to seek to marry her. And, and, and I want to challenge the men in this room that, that you are called to be a Boaz. You are called to do the right thing in any situation. And, and, and yes, um, some of us have plenty of times done the wrong things in our lives, and the grace of God covers that. But, but God has called us men to be Boazes, to stand up and to do the right thing. And I want to plead with the youth in this room not to buy the lies of our culture that say that you should just go around with all sorts of people and experiment, but that God has one person for you, and I encourage you to wait for that person to be a Boaz in a culture that lies to you and gives you other messages. The other note that I want us to make about this is that in this same sense that, that there was a nearer relative to Ruth, there is a nearer relative to us spiritually, and that is the law. And just like we're going to see that, that the other relative was unable and unwilling to redeem her, the law of God cannot redeem us. By our actions, by our obedience, we cannot please God. It is only by Jesus Christ, his blood shed for us on the cross. And he is our Boaz. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Fourthly, Ruth receives gifts from Boaz. Verses 15 through 17. Also he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. So he, he, said, he stops her right before she's about to leave. And he says, 
hey, hey, sweetie, why don't you bring, bring your bag over here uh, to me real quick? And it says that he puts six ephahs of barley, right? So just in case you don't have a measuring spoon that has an ephah uh, on it, uh, I, I've done the math for you. This is about two weeks worth of food, right? He's up to the same thing again, right? First he just sent mom a little bit of leftovers. Now he's sending two weeks of groceries, right? Man, you got to take notes here, okay? So he gives this to her as a gift so that she can be reassured that, that he is going to do all that he can do to redeem her. And, and as she shows up, uh, it says that Naomi says, who are you, right? And, and really the idea there in the Hebrew is she's saying, are you, is that Ruth I hear at the door or is that Mrs. Boaz, right? She's saying, who are you, right? What's, what's your name, sweetie? Because um, she wants to find out what's going on. So Ruth comes in. She's got her Vons bags, you know, overflowing. And, and, she, and she walks in two weeks worth of, of groceries. And Ruth sees that, that this man is, is serious. He, he is serious about doing everything he can do to redeem her. Um, and, and in this same way, we're told in Ephesians uh, 1 at verse 14 that God has given us the gift of his Holy Spirit to seal us so that we would know that he will redeem us and that he ultimately, uh, that we will experience the fullness of our salvation one day and that the Holy Spirit in a sense is a, a down payment, the scriptures say, so that we would know that God will be faithful to bring us to the completion of our salvation when we will be with him one day. He's given us this gift. And then finally, Ruth waits for Boaz to work Verse 18, then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Naomi goes, honey, this guy is not messing around, right? Two weeks worth of groceries. He's a businessman. He knows how to get it done. He is making it happen. Don't you worry, sweetheart. All you got to do is just sit there. And uh, he's going to be at our door very shortly. He is going to figure this out. He is serious uh, about marrying you. And, and I want us to, to really note here, what is Ruth's role in this redemption? She's supposed to sit there. And this is the role that we play in our redemption. It is Jesus who has paid it all. It is Jesus who has gone to the cross for us so that we could be redeemed. And we, like Ruth, come to his feet begging that he would show us mercy, and he does because he is good, because he is loving, because he is a forgiving Messiah and Savior. Um, and, and, and as we close right now, I'm gonna ask the ushers to come forward to um, present the elements of communion that we can remember Jesus' body that was broken for us on the cross and his blood that was spilled for us so that we can receive the forgiveness of our sins. And this idea of sitting still, it reminds us of a couple other um, scriptures that we see. One of them is in Exodus chapter 14. You may remember the story Moses is there with the children of Israel that they have been led out of Egypt after the 10 plagues had happened and Pharaoh finally says, fine, you can, you, can, you can take your people, Moses. And they find themselves in this great predicament as they are at the Red Sea. The Red Sea is in front of them. There's a mountain on their right. There's a mountain on their left. And behind them is Pharaoh's army because Pharaoh had changed his mind. And the children of Israel begin to say to Moses, God has brought us out here so that he can bury us. God has brought us out here because he's digging us our grave. And the problem is that they looked all around them, but they didn't look up. And Moses says to them this in Exodus uh, chapter 14, verse 13, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. What was their role in the redemption, in their freedom? Stand still. And then God uses Moses to part the Red Sea, and they pass through that to their redemption, their, their salvation. In addition to, the, to this, we also read in the book of Psalms, at verse 40, or, uh, chapter 46, verse 10, God says, Be still and know that I am God. 
And in this same way, you and I can be still before God and we experience the redemption and the forgiveness of Christ. This thing that, that we do together called communion. Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. He says that, that the bread is, is a picture of his body that was broken for us on the cross. That as we, we read in that verse in 2 Corinthians, that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might know the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God. And that, that, the, that the juice or wine represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled so that we could receive the forgiveness of our sins. And we do this because you and I need to be reminded that we come to God and we experience relationship with God not based on our works and our accomplishments, but what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And you and I need to be reminded because a lot of times we make this Christian life all about us and, and, and our great victories or our great failures and we get down in the dumps thinking that God doesn't want to see me anymore. And God says, I want you to do this when you gather because I need you to remember that it's not about you, but it's what my son Jesus did for you on the cross so that you could experience victory and forgiveness. So let's, let's pray together, and then we're going to partake uh, of communion after to remember what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace. Jesus, thank you that you are our kinsman redeemer. You are our Boaz. And, and God, thank you that, that you sent your one and only son to, to die for us on the cross so that we could be redeemed unto you, Lord. And Father, I, I, I pray that, that if there's anyone in this room uh, this morning that doesn't know you, Lord, that you, would, that you would just move in their heart, that they would realize that coming to you is, is not about them obeying or, 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 or doing some list of rules, but coming to your feet and saying, have mercy on me. And Lord, you say in your word that if, if we believe in our heart and confess with, with our mouth that you are Lord, that we will be saved. So Father, I, I, just, um, I just pray that right now that you would remind our hearts of the gospel. And Lord, I thank you that even in the Old Testament as we're in Ruth, Jesus, you're everywhere because all of the scriptures speak of you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. So we wanna re remember you and we want to rejoice and celebrate your grace. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Let's partake.